It's uh, it's so it's so wonderful to see all your big beautiful faces. I'm so glad you're here. Um, it makes me happy, I have to say. So today we're going to talk about the frontal lobe and the motor areas in the frontal lobe and sum up our uh, series of lectures on the motor system. You're going to see some um, data regarding what happens when there is um, damage to the frontal lobe in terms of uh, um, uh, something like a stroke. Some of the things that are done to help individuals um, uh, recover from stroke, I'll show you a little bit of that. I'll, t I'll show you a little bit about what's amputation, what does that do to the cortex. So if you lose your limb in an accident, um, how does that affect the cortex? And we'll learn a little bit about um, basically the final stages of making a movement, which is we've gone from the parietal cortex now to the frontal lobe. We have the premotor cortex and the uh, primary motor cortex. They're going to generate the motor commands that are going to produce that movement. And we'll, we'll discuss what they do. So um, here's a central sulcus. And what we're talking about today are things in front of the central sulcus, which is the primary motor cortex, which is uh, immediately anterior to the central sulcus. And then this premotor cortex, which is in front of the primary motor cortex. So in general, the cortex is a complicated area. And we don't really fully understand how it works. So very much this material that I'm showing you is, is you know, things that are changing year after year as our understanding progresses. Um, much of the work that I'll, I've been showing you has to do with in, in primates, how particularly monkeys, how the activity in the cortex depends on um, uh, stimuli that you see, movements that you're about to make. But that's beginning to shift. So now there is, a, because of the ability to control individual neurons in the rodent, much of the literature now is beginning to shift to mice and rats and how they control their movements, how they respond to stimuli. And the reason for that is because um, whereas in the cortex of a primate you can record from a neuron but you don't know what kind of neuron that is. You don't know if it's an inner neuron, if it's a layer 5 neuron, or it's a, you know, what kind of neuron it is, what part of that structure in the cortex it resides on. In rodents, you can, with some, um, uh, with some uh, um, confidence, identify the neuron that you're recording from, manipulate that neuron through what's called optogenetics. And so um, the, the field is shifting toward the rodents because in the rodent you can manipulate individual neurons and you can identify individual neurons. But much of what I've been telling you about is a neuron in some part of the brain, but we don't really know what kind of neuron it was. But there are many kinds of neurons in any given part of the brain. All right, so that limitation still holds because today I'm going to show you is much of it is about the um, primates. And so we talk about neurons in the motor cortex and premotor cortex, and we have some sense of what they do, but we still don't really know what kind of neurons they were and um, what part of the uh, anatomy of the system they participated in. So with that caveat, so I just want to make sure you guys understand where we are with in terms of un, you know, how to attack the, the cortex. Because we can't identify those neurons in the primates yet, much of what I'm about to tell you is you know, colored by that uncertainty. But that's going to change. As you guys um, learn more about the uh, nervous system in, you know, if you go to graduate school, if you become uh, somebody who studies the nervous system, you will be able to learn more about this because the field is moving rapidly now. All right, so here's what you need to know. I'm going to summarize it in one slide. In the posterior parietal cortex, we learned that the neurons care about the location of things with respect to where you're looking. So they care about where is your hand with respect to fixation, where is your goal with respect to fixation, what's the value of the goal, you know, how, how important is it to me, how much reward am I going to get for making a movement toward that goal. Well, we're going to learn that in the premotor cortex, the representation is no longer with respect to fixation, but it's with respect to where is the goal with respect to the effector that are about to move there. So if you're moving your hand, 
it's a representation of where's the goal with respect to your hand. So now what matters is the effector, not the visual coordinates of the representation, but what part of your body you intend to move toward the place where you have reward. And in the primary motor cortex, that becomes in terms of muscles. What muscles are you going to activate in order to make the movement to get the reward? So we go from visual coordinates that represents the hand, the target, the value, to effector coordinates. I'm going to move my hand to this location. And finally, muscle coordinates, the system that's going to move the details that I'm going to have to pursue to make that movement. All right. So a rough idea of our network. So we began with the posterior parietal cortex. We have a location of the target with respect to the fovea. We have proprioceptive information from our eye, from our head, from our arm that tell us where it is. So you get proprioceptive information in the somatosensory cortex, visual information from the visual cortex comes to the posterior parietal cortex. There you get what's called fixation-centered representation of where is your goal, where is your hand. When we get to the premotor cortex, we have this difference vector that says where is the goal with respect to the hand. Finally, when we get to the motor cortex, we get the motor commands, the details of the movement that are about to take place. All right. So let's begin with the premotor cortex. And I'll describe to you an experiment that tells us that fixation doesn't really matter. What matters is where is the goal, where is the stimulus with respect to the hand, not where the animal is looking. So in this experiment, we have a monkey that's sitting down, and its arm is located, let's say, to the right. And when the arm is located to the right, a stimulus is going to be brought forward toward its arm. And sometimes the stimulus is going to be to the right, sometimes to the left, sometimes to the
so what I want to show you is that the neural premolar cortex So it's no surprise that when you get to the primary molar cortex, you begin to see force representation. So here, the amount of force that you're producing will produce higher amounts of activity in the molar cortex, more closer to what the muscles are doing. So in this case, what we have is we have an animal that's sitting down, and the arm is in an exoskeleton, so you can induce forces on the elbow and on the shoulder. You see the exoskeleton. Arm is sitting on basically a um, little robotic thing that is grabbing the elbow and the shoulder. And so that in order for the animal to produce a hold the arm steady, if there's a force on the elbow, then it needs to push against it. If there's a force on the shoulder, it needs to push against it so that it can hold the arm steady at a particular location. What they do in this experiment is that they ask the animal to produce forks. So for example, here's a neuron that's recorded when the animal is producing a shoulder. So shoulder torque is on the x-axis, elbow torque is on the y-axis, and the magnitude of the torque is shown by the vector. So you see that the torque that's being produced is on the shoulder, it's about 0.1 newton-meters. So shoulder torque, that's in this case a flexion. Now the colored graph, show you the neuron activity. So this neuron is very active when the monkey is producing a large amount of shoulder torque, positive. It becomes less active when the monkey is not producing much torque, and then it becomes even less active when the torque falls. There's another neuron that likes torque in another direction. So here is a shoulder extension, elbow flexion. So a movement that involves shoulder extension, elbow flexion, so this kind of movement. And in this case, the neuron fires a lot when the force is in that direction, less when it's in the opposite direction. So you see force coding. Why? Because 
it's a closer relationship to the muscles. And there would be a preference for a, some combination of muscles that would produce a particular force pattern. That's the primary. Okay. And indeed, when a movement is taking place, the timing of activity tends to be earlier in the premolar cortex, a little bit later in the primary motor cortex, then you see it in the muscles of the limb, and then finally the movement of the body. So here's a finger movement, and you see the timing of the activity begins in the premolar cortex, then the primary motor cortex, then the muscles, and then finally the finger.
this mixed in the two. But the basic idea is that you have a map that kind of looks like this. That basically in the mid line of the of the cortex, way up here, you have the toes, the feet, the trunk, and then as you get further out, you get the neck, the nose, and the face. Now, one of the things you notice in these cartoons is that they're always on the nails. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I want to tell you that's a problem. Because, um, of course, not only half the population is female, but that there are things that are specific to females that are just not represented in these maps. So you don't have to, I don't have to tell you what's not representative. Look, you see there is no breast area on this, on this map. Why is that important? Because I'm going to show you what amputation does to these maps. And so what is an example of an amputation that is influenced primarily in the women? Yes. And so there's almost no data on what that means with regard to changes in the context. All right. Perhaps you hadn't thought about it. sense 
demands but doesn't get any sensory feedback, that causes plasticity. And what it does is that it reduces the weight of the synapse, this inhibitory synapse that's going from this inner neuron to this foreign motor neuron. That's re that reduction in the inhibition makes it so that now when you stimulate the brissa, you get movement in the form. It spreads. Okay, so that produces change in that motor neuron. Does that give you more control over, say, the form and the eyelids? Yeah, no, because um, all that does is that it makes, it makes this area become an area that you, you have to learn not to stimulate. Otherwise, you're going to get movements of the form. OK. So in the last 20 years, we've been involved in lots of wars. And those wars have produced a lot of people that have been amputated. And that amputation has led to really one of the common things that's been a result of that is that it's been a result that it has produced a lot of changes in our understanding of the cortex and how it controls movements. It's because when an individual is amputated, what happens is that the sensory and the motor information is going to change. You no longer have the ability to send commands and receive input to receive feedback from the part of your body that's been amputated. So then the question is, do these maps change in these individuals? So first I want to show you they do change. Next I want to show you that sometimes that causes problems with people. It makes it so that they have pain, and it's called phantom pain, the kind of pain that you have in a place that you no longer have. So you have pain in a part of your body that doesn't exist anymore. How could that be? And then we can talk about what might be the basis of that, and we'll learn a little bit about some of the techniques that are used help these individuals. Okay, so amputation. In this case, what we have is a, we have a person that, um, who's, who's been amputated from the right arm above the wrist. So, you know, someplace like here. Now, look at what's remaining. Of course, this is gone. What's remaining are the muscles of the elbow and the shoulder. And so these muscles can be um, stimulated through the contralateral side. So you take a transcranial magnetic stimulator, you place it on the head, and you stimulate, and what you see is that you see EMG in the muscles that are left. And then you can move it around, and you can find the area, the, the size of the area on the cortex that produces this, um, not on the cortex, on the head. So this is a, you know, this individual that has, they don't need any surgery for this. You just have them sit down, you put the stimulator on the head, and you stimulate, you find the area on the motor cortex that produces activity in the biceps, and you move it around until you map out that region. Now what you do, the, do that is you do it again, but you do it on the other side. So now on this side, you do it and you find the region here. And that's shown in the biceps. So here is, here's the biceps area on the right side, here's the biceps area on the left side. The left motor cortex is controlling the right arm. The right arm has been amputated. And, and what you notice is that the biceps area on the side that's contralateral to the amputated arm is larger than the side that's healthy. So the thought is that that amputation has caused plasticity in that person, and that plasticity has led to an enlargement of the area that was neighboring to the part that has been lost. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I don't know if I didn't and you have like worse control, like better control over like muscle? Right. Unknown. Oh, I will show you that with learning of certain skills, the areas do get bigger. So if you're a violinist, it is likely that your representation of the side that's used for moving the bow is probably bigger than an average person, whereas the finger area on the contralateral side is bigger than an average person. So basically, becoming expert at something is using uh, topography. It's using geography, essentially. Of the that it takes neurons to do that. And it, indeed, it seems to be the case. Although, although the evidence is you know, um, from like fMRI, we of course don't know. We don't have monkeys that have any skills that are different from each other. Okay. Um, but, but you know, it's, it's, a, it's a conjecture that I'm making. It's based on indirect evidence that comes from these neuroimages. Okay, 
So, but but also we, we have absolutely no 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 idea whether they're better their biceps on one side. It's just the areas. Okay. So, what does that do? Is it good? Is it bad? So it turns out that there's some indications that individuals that that have a much large a large discrepancy between the size of the uh, these maps on one side and the other after they've had this amputation, they're more likely to have what's called phantom pain. So phantom pain is this condition where an individual can have pain and it can be debilitating in a body part that no longer exists. So you, know, you have no pain receptors that are coming from your hand because you don't have a hand. But you can have pain in that body part. It's called phantom pain. And what the slide is showing you What this slide is showing you is that um, uh, there are three patients on the top, there are three patients on the bottom, different people. And patients on the top, they are non phantom limb pain. So these are people that have had an amputation, but they don't suffer from pain. The ones on the bottom are the ones who do suffer from pain. And there's some indication that this occurs this pain is due to a asymmetry in these maps. So one side is much bigger than the other. And the thought is that maybe this is one of the things that is resulting in this. And the question might deal with why. Why would, why would there be pain associated with um, this loss of sensory information? And we don't know the answer. But I want to show you some conjectures to that. So in this part, what I have put together is how does learning take place? So you have some motor commands that you send to your body. That produces some sensory consequences, and you see it and you feel it. So you move your hand, and you see your hand, and you feel your hand. Where if you didn't have a hand, you could still send the commands down, but there would be no sensory consequences. Your arm wouldn't move, and you wouldn't see it. You wouldn't see any movements. So you have this gigantic discrepancy between what you expected to happen, because that's what you've done all your life, and what you actually get back to. And the thought is that, well, maybe this discrepancy, because it's so big, is a condition that results in pain and makes this debilitating condition for these people. And so an ingenious idea that came about is that, well, may maybe one way to help these people was through something incredibly simple, which is basically a mirror. And you see that. So suppose you take, suppose I've lost my, suppose I've lost my left, left arm. And um, now you place me on a mirror, and what you do is that you have me make movements with my right arm, and you make me look at this mirror. So if I don't have a left arm, and I'm, you're asking me now to make bilateral movements, if I look at my left arm, there's nothing there, I can't see it move. But if I'm looking at a mirror, and I'm moving both arms together, it looks like I am moving my left arm. Huh? And it's actually a rather striking illusion. Um, to, to do it on yourself. You get yourself a mirror and have you have yourself make movements and it really looks striking. Like it really looks like you're moving your arm and you're looking at your arm, which of course you're not looking at your hips a lot. So some of the rehabilitation that's done in the, these two individuals, some of the things that comes about with regard to the improvements that they see has to do with this simple mirror therapy. So there seems to be some daily use that seems to reduce the perception of pain. Maybe the pain is coming because of the discrepancy between what they expect to see and what they actually see, what they expect to feel and what they actually feel. And through simple things like placement of a mirror, you can potentially reduce it. And so there's some clinical trials that are going on to verify whether these claims make sense. Yeah. So theoretically, if you had a prosthetic leg, would that would potentially be similar, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I know you talked about like the like the weight of the inhibitory pathway earlier and like how like the reduction of that weight is kind of what leads to stuff like this. Has any research been done about like maintaining the weight of that pathway in order to prevent this from happening in the first place? So let me tell you about the problems with doing this kind of research. If we're talking about humans, right, so we can't really measure nerve physiology. We can we can they can tell us that they have pain you can try to do something about it, but you don't know the basis of it. In a monkey, it's hard because the monkey can't tell you it has pain. 
what you can measure in your physiology. But also ethically, it's, it's not clear that you amputating a monkey is, is necessarily a good thing to do. Right? So unless, unless there was some injury that took place and you had to do it anyway to save the animal's life, it's just not something that's done anymore. You can then say, okay, what do, what do we do in rodents? You know, maybe we have less ethical concerns with cutting the mouse. And, you know, one can debate that. Why? You know, it's a, it's a, it's a cost-benefit analysis. What's the knowledge that you're going to gain? Who is it going to benefit? And then one has to consider the pain issue and the, and the deficit that you cause in the animal. So, but, it, but in a mouse, you know, I, I don't know. How, do, how are you going to determine this, this concept of you know, So it's really, really hard to get at these questions. Roughly a map. 
And now, of course, when this area is damaged and these, these, these neurons are gone, uh, three months later, you go and you, you look at the, the brain again. So it's the same animal before and after the damage to the cortex. And you notice that, of course, this part is gone. It's not there anymore. It's black. But what's changed is that you see that there's a lot of, there used to be some red up here, and it's much less. So it's become more green. So if you damage the finger area, the digits of the hand of this animal, of course, the animal becomes less likely to want to use this digit because it's weak, and the hand becomes in a flexed posture. But that also affects the neighboring area. So it seems like you, get, you used to have some digit area close, close by that you didn't damage, but that got taken over by the shoulder. So perhaps this is a bad thing, because what is happening is that there is not just loss to the area that was damaged, but maybe that caused the animal to become reluctant to use that body part. And so then neighboring areas grew because of lack of use. So here's the idea, that when you get a stroke, you have weakness. That makes it really hard to use that body part. And if you have any remaining representation of that body part in the cortex, the lack of use makes it so that even those go away. Okay. All right. Yeah. Would it be like such a similar situation to like a person in a coma with lack of use make like those parts go away as well? So we sort of saw evidence of this when we were looking at muscle fibers. Remember we said that in individuals that uh, super athletes versus spinal cord injury, we have this very big difference between the composition of the quadriceps muscle. So lack of use is a factor in how the cortex is going to be organized. And so when there's stroke, there's going to be weakness. And that weakness is going to make it much harder to use that body. Perhaps that makes it so that things become even worse because of lack of use. So one way to get around that is to do rehabilitative therapy. So what one sees, so how do you do rehabilitation in a monkey? What you do is that if the hand was affected, now you give it monkey exercises so it has to use its hand has to use a hand to pick up a small piece of food. And through use, we encourage it to keep using it. And in this experiment, you see that in the monkey that had that use-dependent um, uh, uh, therapy, pseudo-rehabilitation, this, this region that was infarcted, this region that was infarcted means that it was a stroke now, of course it's lost. But the neighboring regions didn't lose the red. So even this region that used to be blue became more red. So it seems like rehabilitation therapy resulted in not just um, you know, recovery in the sense that the hand was used more, but that that prevented and uh, encouraged presentation of this um, areas that wouldn't be lost if there was lack of use. So that led to therapies in humans. And let me show you what that looks like. So one of the therapies that led to these studies is called um, constraint motion rehabilitation. So it's kind of cruel, but this is what is done to help the patient recover after stroke. Suppose that I have my right arm that was affected because I had a left cortex stroke. So now my arm is left. I don't want to use it. I'm going to become a person that's going to rely on my left hand to do things. And that's a bad thing, because if I do that, if I just stop using my arm, I become even worse. So what's done is that in this study, the patients come in and they tie their left arm to them like this. So they have to go through eight hours a day of using their effective arm, the one that is weak, the one that is affected by stroke. And that seems to have some benefits. Not in everybody, it's better than nothing, basically. It's better than um, uh, scenarios where you simply leave them to themselves. But you see that there's some improvement. Here's, here's some measure of performance before um, this, the, the therapy began. And then they, you know, they, they begin the therapy. And then basically, they, they keep it up for 12 days. And then they check the patients four weeks later, six months later. And you can see that there's some, some effect that lasts beyond the therapy itself. It's a small number, just like that. Four, five, six, seven, eight, maybe ten, ten patients here. So these are not big numbers here. I, um, it, it's unclear if this is really a very effective way to deal with stroke because lots of people get better anyway. So we don't know if they would have gotten better if you hadn't given them this therapy. Right? So that's that's a, that's how you do a control study. 
you have to say, some people are going to get this therapy, some people are not going to get this therapy, and then we're going to compare them. That's how you do a randomized controlled trial. But there's some indication that lack of use exacerbates the effects of the, this damage to the cortex, forcing individuals to use it as a form of therapy prevents that loss and may be beneficial in the long term. Okay. All right. Finally, I want to show you what's learning about. So many of you guys participate in sports. You've learned skills. You know how to ski. You know how to play the piano. Um, these are motor skills that you've acquired. And I want to show you that as you learn these skills, you probably are changing your cortex. And the maps that are associated with the control of that body part are changing, probably becoming bigger for the region that you're using to perform the skill that you're learning. So I'll show you this in this, um, uh, in this uh, study about the molecules. So a very simple skill that you can teach a monkey is that you can teach it to pick up a piece of food from a large well, like this, or from a small one. And of course, you don't have to do it with your monkey, right? You can do it with your cat. So I mean, these, are, these are good things to try to cognitively challenge the animals that you love. Give them something fun to do. At the beginning, it's going to be hard, but then they're going to learn how to do it. So large well training is really easy. If you do large well training, animals have to learn anything. They know how to pick up a large, how to pick up a small piece of food from a large well. They do it like this. Small well training is hard because what they have to do is they put their fingers in together to pick up that piece of food. That's a hard thing for them to do. And if you practice, you can learn to do that as well. Okay, so what happens to the mind? So here's small well training, here's large well training. So here's an animal that's a large well training, of course there's nothing to learn. So the map of the motor cortex before and after is largely the same. But here's small well training. The map before training and the map after training, you notice these yellow areas have gotten big, you have more yellow areas in the post training than you have prior training. Now you notice that of course the, the space in the cortex is limited, right? So you, have, you only have a certain number of uh, neurons. And so you can ask the question, what am I, when I'm doing this training here, am I losing the ability to do something else? And you know, that's a great question. We don't know. We don't know the answer. All right. Any questions about this? All right. Let's summarize. Posterior parietal cortex. We learned that you need to represent the world with respect to fixation and assign value to the stimuli that tell us what's the goal, how much reward I'm going to get for it, where is my hand and with respect to fixation, where is the target with respect to fixation. In the pre cortex, we have a representation of the goal with respect to the effector. I care about moving the cursor upward, not about the muscles that are going to move that cursor upward. In the motor cortex, I care about the muscles. We learned about the maps that exist in the motor cortex, that plasticity can change those maps, amputation can change those maps, and can get Phantom pain because of loss of a body part, and we learned that through use, those maps can change and become larger or smaller depending on the experience that we have in our body. Any questions? All right, have a good weekend and good luck on your